I can't say enough good about Matthew Gilbert. Um, not only can he tell you what you think of Mad Men and Orange is the New Black, he's just a really nice guy and a terrific writer. And Off the Leash is his first book, and he'll tell you what it's about, but it's so much fun. It's, it's about dogs, but it's really about people and how dogs um, get people to be more themselves, how their inner selves come out. So, you know, I wasn't a dog person, and then we got a lab, which I describe in the book. Um, I sort of fell in love with a dog person and basically got cornered into loving dogs, and now I can never imagine living without one. Um, but what I didn't realize is that this dog was going to pull me into the dog park. You know, we live in the city, so, you know, when you've got a puppy, you've got to get them out, they've got to play. So I ended up having to become a member of this interesting community. Um, dog parks are little microcosms, they're very political, there's always, you know, a dog fight and then a person fight, and uh, it's, it's fun. Um, so my book is really just about me discovering that world and the intricacies of that world. Um, one of the things that I didn't realize when we got a lab uh, was that I was going to have to throw a ball for him. Um, I'm not a sports person at all. Uh, you know, I jog, I swim, but I don't, I don't know how to throw balls at all. So this, this piece is just about you know, sort of realizing that my little guy was all about fetching. Um, okay. To whom it may concern, please excuse Matthew from sports today, as he is not feeling quite well and he needs to recuperate. He will be back in the swing of things soon. As a profoundly unathletic kid, I forge school gym notes as often as possible. Kids, don't do that. I'd handwrite them with the flirty flourishes I thought an attractive single mother might use, including on one or two occasions, circle dotted eyes and exclamation points. I may even have floated a heart shape above some of those eyes. Oddly, it worked every time, with the help from thick adult stationery and stiff envelopes. Sometimes, my deception successful, I'd smoke cigarettes in a bathroom stall and go to study hall to write something incomprehensible and purple for my journal. I was a sports loser. So it was with some disappointment and discomfort that, as the winter snow and ice began to fade away and as Toby's fetching identity began to emerge fully, I realized I'd need to deal with balls at the park for Toby. I saw what other retriever owners were obligated to do. I'd have to bring tennis balls and squeaky balls every day and keep track of the balls if I didn't want to lose them. I'd have to throw the toys and the balls, maybe use a chucket to fling balls over other people's heads. I'd have to engage in endless ball fetching, pick up balls slimy with Toby's spit, and store balls in my car ad infinitum. I couldn't ignore the fact that Toby was beginning to chase and catch round things and bring them almost back to me. Despite my ignorance of sports and, and Tom's too, Toby was a little jock. His retrieving nature was slowly elevating balls to the top of his list just after food with the biting of fingers and sleeves now becoming less urgent. He'd run full speed ahead, exuberant but serious, with his soft puppy eyes looking back at me as if he didn't quite know what he was running for, then realize, oh, a ball. He'd pounce on it, head and front paws first, and grab it with great purpose, but then sniff something in the grass on his way back to me and drop it as if, I were, as if it were a meaningless object. He was lost in living. Seeing Toby smile, and he did smile as he waited for my arm to spring forth, was a great incentive to deal with my ball issues. His silky ears would bounce and dance as he ran, and I would have all kinds of crazy love pangs. And the thought that he wanted to bring something back to me and only me, that our connection was somehow written into his DNA, was touching. We were buds. There at Amory to highlight my inadequacy was this guy, really a guy's guy, named Drew, who was at the park on weekend mornings. He and his older dog, Chester, a still strapping Ridgeback mix, were an exceptional looking pair as they gracefully played fetch. Drew had an ease about his carriage as he threw a yellow ball, standing apart from the group of people and dogs watching the stately Chester canter and retrieve, canter and retrieve. Drew was a muscle-bound, low-key guy in jeans and sometimes a Springsteen t-shirt, 
not a snob, but not looking for big social activity either. He had a dark, quiet brow, and his hair was always wet from the gym. And Chester was a pumped guy, too, a lithe, short-coated brown dog whose ribs were detectable as he used every muscle at once to pursue the ball. He stayed around the fringes of the center of park activity with his owner, running and holding his yellow prize up for, uh, in his bite for Drew to see. I'd watch them carefully out of the corner of my eye. They made the whole ball thing look just like an effortless, intimate partnership, a volley with a rigorous but not rigid flow. Chester would set off running for the ball before Drew would throw it, before Drew threw it, trusting that Drew would land the ball where he was heading. Once the ball hit the ground in front of Chester, he snatched it in his mouth and did a slower, rounded turn back to Drew. Then he dropped the ball right in front of Drew, a slimy yellow gift, and tear away for the next throw. There was something powerful about watching two beings know each other so well so that each could give the other exactly what he wanted over and over again. If that's not closeness, then what is? Back and forth, back and forth. I knew Toby was ready to try that, complete circular understanding, but I wasn't. I felt like a bad doggy parent, holding my boy back from progress. I'd rarely had to throw over the decades, but when the occasion did arrive, I couldn't skip sports every day. I looked like a Tin Man wind-up toy. So I'd show up at Amory Park excruciatingly self-conscious and reticent about throwing for Toby, knowing that those people who were watching to see the cute puppy retrieve would see my struggle. I was a kid again, like a cheap toy springing forward with a stuttering mechanical jerk. I'd send the ball bouncing erratically a few feet in front of me, like this. You know, or like. Yeah. <laughs> Each fling felt like some kind of public test or challenge, and there was an absurd amount of self-esteem at stake. Sometimes I'd resort to an underhanded throw, an open admission of deficiency. My park friend Nash relished, relished my throwing problem, as did our friend Haley, the gay guy who threw like a little girl. It was fodder for both of them. It's too easy, Nash would say. There were a million gay stereotypes that did not fit me. The style gurus of cable TV would flunk me for my shabby t-shirts and forbid me to con contact or go within 100 yards of the word fabulous but an athletic failure who'd always been picked for last for team sports, who might have tripped on his way to kick a soccer ball, who had just jumped aside when he was forced to play a guard during school football season, that dated chestnut fit me, fit me like a non-baseball glove. It's too easy, Nash would say. They pitched the jokes at me, called me Big Bird, and I caught them. That was a game I enjoyed playing a lot more than this fetching business. One March day, though, Nash instructed me as to the best positioning for throwing so I wouldn't look stupid. It was an act of charity. Throw it to your side, he said, since I was pushing it straight out in front of me like a geek. He took the tennis ball from me, showed me how to throw it, and I watched his arm cross in front of his face. It's like you're squeegeeing your face with your elbow, I said. Right, he said, if that's how you need to see it. Funny how parental roles are not limited to parents, how friends and colleagues and spouses can become the father you didn't have or the brother you did have. Dogs seem to do that effortlessly, finding a family formation in every pack they stumbled upon. Nash threw the ball correctly a few times over to the side, albeit with some exaggeration, so I could see exactly what he was talking about. And I finally did it, and it worked. It gave me a not-so-ridiculous stance. Underneath the teasing, there was this support. It was an awe moment right out of a sitcom. So that's my saga of learning how to throw and uh, my friend teaching me to uh, do it this way, right? <laughs> right? Or when you throw a Frisbee, don't do that, do that. Just a little wisdom here for you people. <laughs> A ping pong ball, so I can sh throw it. No, 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 no. I want you to prove it. Yeah, no, no, no proving it. If you throw something at me, I'll throw it back. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, so that's sort of you know what the book is about. It's about me at the park, but it's also really a lot about other people and the 
the sort of interesting community that forms. Um, I really have come to love the dog park. It's such a, a great spot, you know. People really support each other. There's something about being around dogs that are playing that I think liberates people. It brings out their enthusiasm, it brings out their joy. Sometimes it brings out their anger if there's a, a disagreement. But on the whole, it's just a wonderful environment. You know, dogs are so, can be so carefree and playful. And when we're around them, I think it rubs off on us a little bit. Um, so that's kind of the, the theme of the book. Another theme of the book is, is the fact that I write about television. I'm the TV critic at the Boston Globe. Um, so I spend a lot of my time alone watching TV, which is great. It's a fantastic job. But kids don't watch too much TV. But um, it's a great job. And no, no, he's like, no, I would never watch too much TV. No, uh, no t there's a lot of really good TV out there. So I spend a lot of time alone, which is fantastic. Um, and I love my job, but uh, it can get a little bit isolating. Um, and so one of the nice things about having a dog pull me to the dog park has been getting pulled into this social world and, and really having to kind of come out of myself a little bit, um, turn away from the TV a little bit. Um, so that's been just delightful. Um, and uh, I don't know, does anyone have any questions or uh, comments about dogs or television? We can happily talk about television. Right. Well, he's asking how a person who writes about television ends up writing a book about his dog. Um, it is kind of what I just said, you know, uh, I wrote, I, I mean, I was alone a lot and then I got pulled into this new experience and it was really eye-opening. And, you know, every writer, I think, when something new happens to them, starts thinking, wait, maybe this is, maybe this is my book. This, maybe this is my great American novel. This is it. So I, um, I started wanting to write about it. I was so excited about this new culture that I found. And so I wrote a piece for the Globe about the dog park, which really got a huge response. I mean, I, you know, I, I knew that the dog park was important to me, but I didn't realize that across the country, there are people who really feel the same way. They go there every day. I mean, you form these amazing relationships because you're seeing these people once, sometimes twice every day, you know, because you have to take your dog and your dogs are playing and you feel a little bit opened up and there's a little bit of anonymity. So, um, you know, it's, uh, so I just wrote this piece and I got a lot of nice feedback. So I basically thought, well, maybe this is a book. And uh, it turned out that it, it was. Uh, St. Martin's Press thought it was, and so I wrote for them. Ever? Yeah. Ever. Sopranos. But you haven't seen it, because it's an adult show. What's your favorite show? Ever. Yeah. What? Family Guy. Family Guy. That's a good one. <laughs> South Park? Yeah. 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 You like the animated stuff. Good. That's a great question. She's asking, like, what's it like to go from writing about TV shows to writing a book? Um, you know, writing about TV shows for a daily newspaper. Oh. And my favorite part about writing the book was not having to write for the newspaper for six months. I, got, I took a six-month leave, which was great, unpaid. But uh, that, was, that was a highlight, because I've been at the Glow for 28 years. So to get that six months to just do something different was such a treat. And, um, but you know, the idea of when I write for the newspaper, I'm writing really fast. I mean. Sometimes I have to write something, you know, in an hour or two hours really fast and just, it, that's it. I've written it, it's in, it's over. Um, and when I'm writing it, I really try to squish in as much as I can say in as little amount of space as possible. So to go from doing that for all these years to sitting down and trying to stretch out my ideas and write a full book with one big story um, was a real challenge. It's a real different kind of writing. The great part, I, I was sort of joking about getting six months off. I mean, that was nice. Uh, actually, it was five months. Um, but 
but also just meeting that challenge was really exciting. You know, when I, when I was maybe a third of the way through the book and I thought, hey, I'm doing this, you know, this is happening and I can do it, it was very satisfying. You know, it was a, a challenge that um, I felt that I was, uh, you know, mastering. And, and so that was really exciting. And, you know, I mean, who knows, you know, you, maybe someday you'll spin your, your poetry into some sort of book, you know? It's very satisfying. I highly recommend it. Um, she's asking me if I'm thinking of writing another book. You got any good ideas that you want? Because I'll steal them from you. Give me a good idea, anybody, and I will steal it, and I will spin it into gold. No. And I won't give you any credit. No. Um, I would like to write another book, absolutely. I mean, I'm still working at the Globe and, you know, in the newspapers all the time, but I would love to find an idea that is interesting enough to me and commercial enough to sell. Um, you know, I'm fishing around for ideas. I'm toying around with maybe fiction, but fiction is very, very challenging and difficult, you know. Um. Uh, the book, it's a great question. The, the book, I, I felt like I had to focus it on one year. So it's my first year at the park. Um, and the people I met and my reactions to the strangeness of it. Um, but I kind of threw in stuff maybe from later on, but took some license with that. So it's the setting of the book is one year. Um, but now at this point it's been 10, ten years because Toby is 10. So. Um, Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you what, you know, the book, the book really celebrates the people at the dog park, but there are a couple of villains. There are two major villains. The, 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 the biggest villain is anyone who brings a, an aggressive dog and um, allows that dog to harm a, or, or threaten other dogs without, you know, look, if you've got a, a, a difficult dog, keep him on a leash. You can still come to the park, but you really need to be vigilant. Um, so people who are irresponsible about aggressive dogs, just nobody wants to see them. Um, the other villains are the people who won't pick up their dog's poop. <laughs> and unfortunately, they are never the ones who step in it. It's always the people who are responsible who end up, you know, they're leaving the park, they're carrying their poop bag to the, gr uh, to the barrel, and they step in it. You know, it's always the way. Right, exactly. The people who left it there are like, I'm not going, let's, let's walk around there. Right, exactly. Good point. Anyway, thank you so much, you guys, for hanging out. I really appreciate it. And uh, have a good day. Enjoy Boston. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps there is something to be gained by firsthand knowledge of one of the Earth's truly bad places. <laughs> Some wisdom and exposure to the dark heart of power Unfortunately, I don't know what that is. <laughs>